It's 1984. Ellen Weir Casey is on the set of a talk show, ready to be interviewed about her miracle baby, the first so-called test tube baby born in Colorado. The lights dim, the cameras roll, and the host coils up, ready to strike. The minute this show went live, she put her face right into my face and said, wouldn't you say you are playing God? This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. Ellen Weir Casey is the hero I didn't even know I had until about a month ago, a pioneer I'm so grateful to have been able to thank in person. Because Ellen and other brave women paved the way, often in the face of outright opposition to this new medical technology of in vitro fertilization, moms like me are holding babies today. Or in my case, trying to sneak in a hug every now and again with my 17-year-old in vitro baby. In fact, in 2019, about 84,000 babies were born through in vitro fertilization in the U.S. alone, a statistic that thrills Ellen. By the time I delivered my in vitro baby in 2005, it didn't even occur to me that this could be a controversial procedure. After reading Ellen's new memoir, Unstoppable, about her in vitro journey, I was so excited to talk to her. And when I clicked the button to admit her to our Zoom chat, she just lit up the whole computer screen. You'll know what I mean as soon as you hear her start telling her story. You can just hear her big smile. And that laugh of hers? Today we're going to hear Ellen's story with a little bit of mine woven in, and then we'll discuss how it felt to go through fertility issues and how to best support others who are going through them now. Just a warning, you might need a tissue. I still can't get through this interview without one. Well, my name is Ellen Weir Casey, and I'm a pioneering mother in assisted reproductive technology. I was one of the first women in the world to have a baby conceived via in vitro fertilization. At that time, her birth was such a, a strange and thrilling event. She made headlines all over the country and around the world as Colorado's first test tube baby, which is what the babies were called at that time. Um, so I've written a book called Unstoppable, and it explains a patient's journey through the earliest days of infertility treatment, which are quite different scientifically and medically than they are now, yet the emotions and the longing and the grief and the agony and the pain and the joy are exactly the same as couples and especially women are going through right now. Yeah. Add some anxiety and uncertainty from just being one of the first, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, there was not another person in the world I could ask what their journey was like. When I had my daughter, only two test tube babies, as they're called, had been born in the world. The famous Louise Brown, who was born in 1978 in England. And she was, her birth was facilitated by the famous Dr. Steptoe and, and Dr. Edwards. So I knew of her, but of course there was no way I could ever be in touch with her parents. Remember, these were the days before the internet. These were the days before any kind of communication other than phone calls or written letters. So there was no way I could track down her mother and ask her about it. And then the second uh, test tube baby was born in the United States in 1982, I think, 1981, December of 1981, okay. um, Elizabeth Carr. And so her mom, I knew her mom's name was Judy Carr, but there was no way I could reach out to her. So there were, I was absolutely alone in a brave new world. Yes. Which, oh my goodness, we appreciate so much those who have come after you because we had a support system. We had a support system yeah. built in with other patients and I had other friends who had gone through it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that makes a big difference. So thank oh, you. I'm, you're welcome. I'm, you know, and that was my goal. As soon as as I became pregnant with my daughter, I called the in vitro program I had gone to, which was in Texas at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in Houston. I called my doctor and said, I will speak to 
anyone you want me to speak to. I will speak to patients. I will speak to potential patients. I will speak to the press. I will speak to lawyers. I will speak to anyone so that the information can be get out in the public that in vitro fertilization exists in the United States. That's amazing. Just amazing. So, and not so long ago, which is another crazy part of that. That's it's, one generation and look how commonplace it is now. It's crazy. Yes. It was such a different time. As I said, there was no, no technology on which to do research. Yeah. So I had to sit in the library basement going through medical journals and reading them on microfiche. Luckily, I had studied Latin in school, so I was able to understand a lot of it. There was no other way to get any information. And when that first baby was born, it was, everyone was thrilled about Louise Brown's birth, but no one ever thought there would be another baby. It was just an anomaly that had happened and people went on with their lives. And when I had my child, it was being known around the world that, whoa, there are now two more test tube babies. This is not right. And it was met with fierce theological and moral ethical resistance. So I made it my mission to explain what in vitro was and to try to help people understand it because I think resistance, hatred, anger are all based in fear and yeah. lack of understanding. Yeah, just the unknown. Right, so that is why I publicized her birth with intention and People are very different. I met the mother of one of the first, very first babies in the United States, not not Elizabeth Carr's mom. And she never told anyone. Really? That it was her son. And I thought, how interesting. Because I felt such an obligation to share my success in this wonderful procedure with people, women who had completely blocked fallopian tubes have at that time no other, no option at all to get pregnant and have their own child. And now they did. That is why I went on the television talk shows and um, my book begins on a talk show set in Boston. And of course I knew my audience and I knew I was going to have a Irish Catholic based audience. And the Pope, of course, later after this, but the Pope said this was morally illicit in vitro fertilization. He hadn't wow. said that yet. <laughs> but when I was on the talk show, the doc, the um, host said to the doctor from Harvard, who was on with me, now we're going to have you explain in vitro fertilization. Then he said to the doctor from Brigham, Brigham and Will Women's, and we want you to explain you know, more about this process. And to the bioethics attorney, we want you to explain more. And she rather dismissed me and said, oh, and Ellen, really? near, near the end of the show, we'll just show pictures of your baby. And I thought, you're just the one with direct experience. No big deal. <laughs> right. She, she really dismissed me. And of course, it was all planned because the minute this show went live, she put her face right into my face and said, wouldn't you say you are playing God? Oh. <laughs> and I could see all of these well-known professionals on the stage who may freeze. They just didn't know what to think, but I was ready for her. And of course I thought, are you kidding me? I have been through 10 major surgeries. I've had ectopic pregnancies. I've had so many losses. You're not going to rattle me. And, and I said, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, again, wouldn't you say you're playing God? And I said, no, I thank God for the difference, uh, the gifted scientists and physicians who enabled me to have this treasure, my own baby. And she kept hammering at me. I think this is playing God. And I said, it's no more playing God than setting a broken bone or doing a heart bypass. It's simply bypassing the fallopian tubes. And it is such a gift. I think because it was live TV, she was hoping to get a rise out of right. me, controversy. But I react. I responded only with loving kindness because I wanted people to know what a gift 
IVF is. Yeah, she didn't know who she was going to be facing. <laughs> she did not. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I loved that was a perfect opener for the book. That was set the scene so beautifully. Oh. So <laughs> as you've kind of alluded to, um your in vitro pro procedure was not the first experimental or invasive procedure that you had. Can you tell us a little bit of what led to your infertility in the first place? Yes. In, uh, in the 1970s, when I had gotten out of college, that was a time when, of course, I was trying not to have a family. And so I went to a doctor, um, a well-known physician in Colorado Springs. And I might add to you that in, that, in those days, there were not female gynecologists anywhere. That was ne never an option for any of the surgeries I had. They were only men. Now I will tell you that I had wonderful men, sur male surgeons That's good. anyway. But so I went to this physician whom I knew of, he had a great reputation and he said, Oh, have I got something for you? And he said it in an sort of an, not arrogant in a, he just thought he was a big deal because he was testing a unapproved IUD and he should never have given an unapproved IUD to a young a woman in her 20s who wasn't married who had never had a child yeah. but he did and three months later I had a terrible infection and ended up in the emergency room and that infection completely scarred my entire peritoneal cavity but specifically my fallopian tubes that was the beginning. But then I got married and we wanted to have the child right away. We were both 29, which just seemed wildly old at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to, a, of course, a different doctor who did the hysterosalpingogram yes. that women still have today. I remember well. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, it, he said superciliously, well, we'll just see if I squeeze this dye hard enough and your tubes will pop open. Meanwhile, I was in agonizing pain and they did not pop open. And then he said, well, no problem. I'll do surgery to open those. Now, there was no way for me to research this, but I was smart and educated and knew probably he wasn't, he wasn't the appropriate doctor to try to open something as small as fallopian tubes. Well, especially if he's, especially if he's talking about just popping them open with dye. That, sh yeah. that shows a certain yeah. uh, lack of understanding. <laughs> yes. So I went to the University of Colorado to a specialist who gave me two names. One was Dr. John Smith, a, a um, fertility specialist in Colorado Springs, and Dr. Victor Gomel. It almost chokes me up to say his name. I must tell you, he is now known as the father of microsurgery worldwide. And he was based in Vancouver, Canada. So I went to him and he did his experimental microsurgery and only opened one fallopian tube in a seven hour surgery. Uh -huh. And that was no one had heard of microsurgery done on gynecological microsurgery was just beginning. It didn't even exist in the U.S. And that surgery was a success. It did open the tube. However, the scarring had been so severe that there was a little bud of scar tissue left in my tube and the embryo was caught on that. So that caused a life-threatening ectopic pregnancy. In those Which days- Luckily, you were educated enough to recognize what was happening to you so that you got in right away. I sure did. I, as we were driving to the hospital, I was in such pain. And I said to my husband, if I pass out, keep driving because this is what we call them a tubal pregnancy. And he went, what? <laughs> but I had been, you know, reading everything yeah. I knew. Um, I knew that's what it was. And now there is a medication for that methyltrexate that is an injection and that stops the growth of the embryo. So the woman's life isn't in danger. My life was, and I had to have immediate surgery to save my life. Then I was back to the same place, square one, only one fallopian tube and it was blocked. So then I was in the library basement with my microfiche going through medical journals. And I found a doctor in Hartford, Connecticut, 
who was the only person in the world experimenting with laser surgery to open blocked fallopian tubes. So I went to him and he did his laser surgery on me, which was brand new and it worked, but I had a resulting terrible infection that caused me to lose that tube. But the good news is the doctor I said, uh, the two doctors on that piece of paper, one was Dr. John Smith in Colorado Springs, and he knew what I'd already been through. So he managed to carefully save the ovary and the very top of the fallopian tube, just so that I could perhaps still have a chance to have a baby. Which is amazing because the technology to have the baby wasn't yet. No, no, had there, not yet hadn't been, been invented. invented. Or, wow. Yeah. Well, we, what right. foresight that he had. He, and I, I will, this is just a quick aside, but I will tell you that I had lunch with him. He lives in Arizona. I had lunch with him at the Garden of the Gods two oh, weeks ago. Really? I can, he was in town with his wife. And I said to him, to be able to see you 39 years later and to thank you in person for changing my life forever for the better is... Oh almost overwhelming and it was for all of us sitting yeah for him yeah for them too and he did yeah. he saved my ability to have a child by not removing the tube which he easily by not removing the ovary which he easily could have yeah so then I had no other options and what I did was I I covered every base I could we were on adoption agency lists, which at that time was impossible to get in. It would take five years and you had to be under 34 or under, and we would have aged yeah. out. Yeah. Um, I, my friends were all at home watching talk shows for me. My friends who, who weren't working took notes on the Phil Donahue <laughs> show, show and they would call me in the evening and go, oh my God, I just saw somebody called a surrogate parenting associates that has just opened and there's a woman who's pregnant with a couple's baby. So of course, I immediately found where this was in Louisville, Kentucky, and my husband and I flew there to talk to them and, you know, hopefully have a surrogate baby. So I had, we were in on adoption lists. We were on surrogate parenting list. I did everything I possibly could so that we would be able to have a baby one way or another. I would have taken any child. I was a kindergarten teacher. I adore children. Mm -hmm. Children are, are my life. I love them so. And any baby that we would have gotten would have been loved just as much as we love our Elizabeth now. And in fact, as a kindergarten teacher, my whole career when I would have, or first grade teacher as well, when I would have an adopted child in my class, I always had a very special feeling toward that child thinking you could have been mine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Okay. So I just, the whole, the big question I had as I was reading this book and as I've been re-listening to your story is just how, how did you hold on to hope when door after door kept getting slammed? I had a goal, a single-minded goal to have a baby. And I did, I knew I could do it. I trusted myself to, to get, help us build a family one way or another. And yes, I was flattened onto the floor when I lost that first, when I had that first ectopic and lost that first baby. I just thought, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. What will I do? Yeah. And then I pulled myself back up and thought, I will keep trying. I will keep looking. I will keep researching. And I think it really helps to take power into your own hands and to do your own research. And I know young women today are still doing that and to find the very best place to go. And that is what I did every time I had a disaster I, you know, felt terrible, heartbroken. And then I thought, okay, I'm getting back in here and I'm going to see what else I can do. Private adoption. I'll call you and see if I can, you know, talk to the lawyers. I'll do anything I can. I just had, I'm resilient 
and I had perseverance and I never once took my eye off my goal. Amazing. That's so cool. So, um, you talked about the social climate right after you were successful yes. and, and as this was a new technology, how did you see that change? How, how quickly did that change? And, and was your daughter ever treated differently or were you treated differently um, because of the procedure? No, no. And that is one of the main reasons that I publicized it. My, I had a twofold goal. One was to share the news of this, of this wonderful, wonderful new technology with other couples who were the dead end and didn't have the, the determination or the assets or the information to keep looking like yeah. I did. But also I wanted to be sure that Elizabeth, my daughter was not looked at as some strange alien because at that time, no one knew when I had her, no one, including the doctors knew whether or not these babies would be normal. And ultrasound was very rarely used in the eighties. When I was pregnant with her, her head was measured every month. And I finally said to my obstetrician, why, why do you think they need that information in Houston? And he said, they're checking to see if her head is growing, if her brain is developing properly. And I think that, you know, still they thought these babies could be little aliens. And it, it, that's why I kept publicizing it and talking to everyone I could. So, and showing off, luckily Elizabeth was fat is <laughs> and was fabulous and darling, but I made sure that information was shared about what the perfectly normal darling babies these were and the only difference with her birth than any other baby was her conception, the method yeah. of her conception. Yeah. And, and I don't know, I don't know if it was the same for you. If you, did you actually get to watch the transfer on, on, um, ultrasound? Oh, heavens. No. Yeah. I, I wouldn't very, think that you would have back then. Very advanced. Yeah. So I like looking at, you know, now I've had five pregnancies and births. Um, I, I look back on all my pregnancies and I think how privileged and how special that was to like actually see the moment that, oh. that, you know, I could just see bubbles. It's microscopic, you know, but I could see, like, I was there and aware of the moment that those eggs were, or those fertilized eggs were put into my body. And it was, it was like a really spiritual experience actually to, it was, it was beautiful moment that a lot of people don't get to experience who haven't gone through, you know, there's a lot of tough things about that experience, but there were a lot of beautiful and uh, hopeful. And I mean, I don't know, there were so many emotions and I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Just all the, the work and the, the hope and the, um, faith that we had to go through to, to get our, our first son. But a, a lot of that is unique because of people like you who traveled the road before us. So anyway. Oh, thank you. You, yes, I, I also felt that even so far before you, it, um, I was very aware that I was part of a team. They, the, the program I went to in Houston was only the second one approved to operate in the United States. And from the minute we walked into that office, everything felt very different. We walked up to the desk and the receptionist said, I said, Ellen and Peter Casey to see Dr. Quigley. And she said, congratulations. Oh, so it was thrilling. And we yeah. were immediately meant to be pulled in to being a part of this team and now well when I had the transfer it felt just like that this wonderful nurse practitioner Sylvia who had been with me every single day during this um, in vitro attempt was the one who walked into the darkened room holding the embryos in in the little syringe it just like she and she had her hands together like she was praying, holding this so carefully. And it meant so much. It, it really, it gives me shivers to hear your yeah. story 
But it that was a moment. And that is the moment in which my book ends. Because my book is about what led up to having this baby. And now it has come full circle because of writing the book. I was able, I needed to legally get in touch with all of the doctors whom I had visited and had surgery done by for, I had to get legal releases from them. So uh -huh. I'm now in touch with Dr. Gomel in Vancouver, who is so world famous. He has the, the um, French Legion of Honor Medal, which is the highest honor the French government gives. Wow. So I got to talk to him. And Dr. Quigley, my IVF doctor, is just tickled to death about this book. And he read it and he said, oh, my God, I'd forgotten all those times. Because to him, he was working on the science. Yeah. And so I, he goes, oh, and I, in that everything has come full circle of a with a tiny group worldwide of people who were trying so hard to help couples create a family. What a beautiful way to that thing to dedicate your life to, isn't it? Oh, and I say that at the beginning, I said to mm -hmm. my heroes and I list all of their names because they are my heroes. And well, they're also, I will tell you, they're also very funny now. <laughs> For instance, when they read my book, I said to one of them, I, I said to uh, Dr. Quigley, I said, now, um, you know, I have a question for you. I feel like you so carefully controlled the information I was given. Every day, I would meet with the nurse who would tell me what would happen the next day. They never told me if they had any pregnancies in their program. They never told me how I was doing or what happened next. And he, I said, you never said what was going to happen next. And he laughs. He goes, that's because we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Isn't that great? That is great. <laughs> and then when he, wow. he told me a story about when he was a um, doing his fellowship at Northwestern University Hospital, that the doctor said to him, you know, Martin, this IVF thing, or no, no, this test tube baby right. thing is never going to go anywhere. Don't even bother pursuing it. Wow. <laughs> and here he, he opened the second program in the United States. And then, oh, he's funny. He said to me now, Ellen, your book is perfect. Everything you've written about the program is wonderful, but I'd like just to have you add one thing for the second edition. My eyes are blue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Do you love it? <laughs> great. Yeah. That is great. And and Sylvia, Sylvia Pace Owens, um, about whom I met, I speak a lot in the second half of my book, the in vitro part, was so wonderful. And after I sent her a copy of the book, she wrote me a thank you note. And the thank you note was thanking me for the book and for telling about their program at its inception. And she also said, and thank you for being brave enough yes. to trust us with this experiment and be our patient. Yes, which is just what I keep thinking over and over as you're mentioning heroes, like, little did I know you are one of my, <laughs> I mean, when I was going through it, I didn't know yeah. Yeah. you at all. But now I know that you are one of my heroes. For oh. making it, so. Thank you. That gives me the shivers. It means so much to me. I, I just feel that it's so important for young women to know the stories of the women who went before them and opened doors you can walk through right now, but doors that didn't even exist. I was walking into a wall, yeah. but I found and, a way. And now it's commonplace. I mean, everybody knows that that's an option. Yes. yes. And that's amazing. And, and it wasn't then. And as you said, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. How rapidly things have changed. Yeah. That's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about the emotional side of all this, um, which as you mentioned right in the beginning, hasn't changed. That assumption that I think, I feel like most women have the assumption that they will at least have the option to bear children. Yes. So when you find that, that when you found that that was going to be harder and harder and, and the doors kept closing, um, how did that how did that feel to you? And how did you handle those feelings? I couldn't breathe. 
I couldn't breathe. All I ever wanted was to be a mother and to have my own baby. Plus, I had the additional weight on my shoulders of having used that IUD. Even though it wasn't my fault, it wasn't my fault at all that I'd been given something I shouldn't have. I still felt it was my fault. And I had destroyed my own dream and the dream of my husband. So it was hard. It was trying to pull myself out of what I felt I had ruined. That it was terrible. It was very hard, but I never told anyone. In those days, no one talked about miscarriage ever. It was never mentioned. And when you saw someone who had adopted a baby, no one ever knew why these couples adopted children. It, it was a taboo conversation. So I held every bit of emotion inside. And I didn't tell my husband and I didn't tell my doctors because I was living in a, a man's world in the 1970s, early 1980s. And I could never risk coming across as an emotional woman because I felt that they would say, oh, honey, we don't want you to do that anymore. Don't let's just not continue this. The doctor could have doctors could have said that as could my husband. So I kept it all in. And there's a scene in the book where I'm packing to go to Houston to see if we could be accepted into the in vitro program. And my best friend, Claire, said to me, Ellen, are you in her southern accent? Ellen, are you scared? And I said, Claire, I'm terrified, but I'm not terrified of the surgery. I'm terrified that they will tell me I can't even try this new thing called IVF. I'm terrified that I'll never become a mother. Oh, uh, oh, it yeah, it just brings back so many feelings. And I, like I said earlier, I was able to talk freely about it still. And I had a support group and it was still hard to express those emotions. And I feel like irrational as it, as it may be, that still happens where we blame ourselves. Like I wondered, well, if I had never been on birth control, I had just been on pills. If I had never taken birth control pills, um, would, did that change something for me or, and just, and just being like, why was I ever trying to prevent a pregnancy when it right. then was so hard? Um, so I felt a little guilt for that. I know people who have had miscarriages and they go through every little minute detail of the pregnancy. Did I eat something wrong? Did I exercise too hard? Did I do this, 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 what did I do wrong to cause this? I think that's such a normal feeling as irrational as it may be sometimes it is it is and it's it's all tied up i think it, it, the basis of it is the love you have for your child that you haven't even met your child that hasn't even been conceived you love that child already and feel that something you did is preventing that child from being here yeah yeah it's heavy it's so heavy. It, it, it really is. Yep. And, you know, I, I'm very vulnerable in my book. As you know, I, I reveal everything that I was feeling because it's important to be vulnerable in order to make a connection with a reader. Yeah. And every woman who is going through any form of infertility or loss will relate to what I've written, as will, will the people who love her. And that's important, too, for their women's friends, their families who have children easily to read this and go, oh, my God, that's how she feels. In fact, Peter, my husband, even said to me, you never said you never told me you were that scared all the time. But again, I wasn't scared of the medical procedures. I was scared that I wouldn't have a child. Yeah. Oh, so that was going to be my next question actually is about friends and family. Um, after going through it, what suggestions do you have to friends and family of people who are going through fertility issues of how to support? What did people, what are the, the good things that people did to support you? And what were some of those not so helpful things? Well, first of all, people didn't really know what I was doing. 
But when I had the first ectopic, that was well known as I had to take off several weeks from teaching to recover from the major surgery. And I was amazed by the phone calls I got from parents of students in my kindergarten class who said, I know how you feel. I had a miscarriage too. I lost a baby too. That helped for someone to say, I know how you're feeling. It happened to me too. Even to today, people don't often share their deepest hurts. Some yeah. of the deepest hurts you have in your life, you do keep in. That was very helpful. When something not to say, oh, is, you know, oh, don't worry, dear. Don't worry, dear. You just go to a beach, just go on a vacation. You'll get pregnant. And people say that people always mean the best, but they don't realize that is not the problem with a woman whose fallopian tubes are missing. She can't go get pregnant on the beach. Yeah. Um, oh, it was God's will. No, I don't think that was. That hurts. That makes you feel terrible. And of course, from biblical days, infertility has been viewed as a punishment from God. So we, that's another reason I think we have, you know, a thousand, 2000 year history of feeling it's my fault. This yeah. Is shame. Something I've done. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so sad. It's so sad. And it reminded me while you were talking of, because we were very open about it, even when we were trying and there was some shame there too. I, I remember wanting people to know that we were trying to have kids to know so that they knew that that was our value, that, that those were our values, that we family was important to us, that kids were important to us, that um, that was something we wanted. And so I was very vocal about the fact that we were going through infertility from the very big infertility treatments from the very beginning. And, um, but it was interesting because these things, first of all, there's a monthly reminder, right? That you can't, that you are not pregnant again. And so it's, it's this very all consuming thing. And it just kind of became my identity. Like I'm infertile, like that's part of my identity. Mm -hmm. And, and it was, I would explain it to people and I would tell them what we were trying. I was very open all, all the way through, but then it was, it was very strange when that became such, it became this weird part of who I was like that, that, that was my struggle that actually it was, it was a weird identity shift when no, actually now I'm pregnant and now I'm a mom. That, that old story isn't my story anymore. I, maybe I'm not explaining it well, but it yes. was, it was just a weird reality. Yes. I bet it was. Of course it was. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. called me, people um, did kind things. Like in, in the uh, book, there's a story of my cousin calling me from LA and saying, listen, I want you to call this person because they just adopted a baby girl through a private lawyer in San Francisco. And the person whose name she gave me is one of the most famous movie directors in the world. And it, they're in film, my cousins. And so I just thought, okay. He, they're just people. So I just picked up the phone and called and had a lovely conversation with them. But it, but it was the fact that she called me to share a hope. Yeah. And that, that this, the man, I didn't speak to him. I spoke to him and his wife. Both were more than happy to talk to me and to try to help. People do try to help. Today, I worry when I look at all, all of the Instagram sites about, and these Dear women showing photographs of all of their shots, their leftover syringes. And, you know, this is day eight and day eight of, of all the different stages of these frozen embryos or thawing embryos. And it just breaks my heart. I think there is an awful lot of information out there. And I'm not sure that that's a, as good of a thing as it could be because there are so many options now. And how does a young woman, a young family find who is having the most success? Where's the most successful program? What are they doing differently than other programs? There are a lot of options. It's yeah. good, but it's just overwhelming. All of it is, it's too much when what you want is to hold your own baby. 
Well, yeah. And not to mention the advice when people just knew we were trying and we weren't going through any procedures yet. And oh my gosh, you should have heard all the sex advice that we got about how oh. to conceive a baby. <laughs> <laughs> from people that I didn't really want to be talking about no. it with. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, it was that was crazy. Um, Yeah, even things like baby showers, people didn't know how to act around me. Like, do we tell? Like, some, some of my friends kept their pregnancies secret until, a, like, it was very obvious. And... For me, that actually made me feel worse than if they would have shared their news and let me celebrate with them at the beginning, um, because obviously I'm going to find out anyway, you know, yeah. I, but I know other people who really needed that to be put, to be um, put gently to them, you know, who, who really needed some lead up to that. So I think everybody's different. So yeah. You know, I agree. there's not really I, a set, a set standard piece of advice that you can give for friends and family, but no, there really isn't just to listen yeah, and say, do you want to talk? Is there anything I can do? And I, I certainly believe that when someone loses a baby and boy, when embryos are transferred and they don't implant, that is a loss of a potential baby. Yeah. To me, it's just like a miscarriage. And I so appreciated the people who did come up to me and say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It, because that was acknowledging that, yes, I had been pregnant. Yes, there were embryos. There was a baby there that no yeah. longer is. I think that's important. Yeah. But um, <laughs> just go on Instagram and you will find lists of things to say and of things not to say. Yeah. 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 baby showers that was that was hard yeah uh, when it is hard when your best friend gets pregnant especially when your best friend gets pregnant with twins and complains about oh, being man. pregnant one thing i would say is never complain about being pregnant to a woman who's having a hard time getting pregnant that is great advice yeah, yeah. i my my cousin's two daughters two of her daughters who were still in high school got pregnant while I was trying to get pregnant. Oh. And for me, that was the most, that was the thing that put me over the edge. That was the most crushing thing for me because they were trying to decide, keep it, not don't keep it. Like, what do we do with these babies? Mm -hmm. I, you know, oh. they, they, they did keep them and it's been beautiful and they, they have made a great life. But at that time I was like, how is it so easy for these people who weren't ready to be pregnant? And I have the same, like, we share some genes, you know, like we're related. <laughs> Why am I struggling so much when it's I am ready and want it so much? You really stretch yourself and grow emotionally and philosophically, your integrity all grow because of this horrible situation yeah we have both each found ourselves in because you have to be a better person you will have to take the high road yes. even when you want to scream there's a book called every pregnant cheerleader and that's oh. what it's about but you you do feel resentment and you know it's wrong you know you can't judge your situation by theirs or vice yeah. versa but it there was many a time when I left a baby shower I I would go and I would leave and have to pull my car over and just sob yeah and I wasn't angry at Sally for being pregnant but I was brokenhearted that I wasn't yes yes I adopted so many of my friends children I would just I was like <laughs> I please let me watch your kids this weekend yeah. you guys go out <laughs> You know, I had, I had, in fact, now they're all graduating from high school. They, in oh. the last two or three years, all of my babies that were, that were oh. mine before I could have my own, they're, they've all been graduating and moving on with their lives. And I'm just like, you, you probably don't even remember me, but you were oh. one of my first babies. And that was something for me that worked. And I know that doesn't work for other people, but like just loving and ha building these relationships with other babies and other small children of my friends 
they definitely needed the break too. So it was a very mutually beneficial relationship. But that was one of the things that I appreciate from my friends is that they just let me in. They let me in to mother their their children, to be part of their families. And they were, they were, you know, my cheerleaders <laughs> all yeah. along the way too. That that's really true. And that was wonderful. I so appreciated when my friends who did have babies said, Do you want to hold him? Oh, yes. And it was there was nothing better. There yeah. was nothing. There is nothing better, is there, than holding no. <laughs> a baby? It's yeah. oneness with the world that you feel no other way. When uh, when I had Elizabeth, I felt that she probably would be my only child. But of course, I did try two other times. It didn't work. Okay. But I held her every single morning nap for her first three months. I sat in a chair. We lived in a house that was built on the side of the mountain in Chapita Park. And I sat there holding my sleeping baby and looking out at the mountains and feeling all is right with the world. You know, and that is another one of the blessings is that you definitely do not take that baby for granted. I, I, oh, again, flood of memories of just like sitting there all hours of the night. I did not have an easy first baby. He was my hardest baby by far as far as like colicky and and crying all the time and screaming, I was pretty fine with it. Like it it was hard and, you know, there were, there were moments, but I think it changed my perspective to have worked so hard (laughs) and anticipated it for so long um, to be able to get through those hard times. And that was one of my last questions for you is how do you feel like the process the, all the all the procedures and all the process that you went through to get your daughter, how do you think that affected uh, the rest of your motherhood journey? Oh, I just adored her. She was still is so precious. I I caught sight of myself in a mirror and I was alone walking in the bedroom holding this teeny newborn and I caught sight of myself and I just remember going, I have a baby. My dream came true. I'm holding her. And I've just adored her from every, every second of every day. She's been wonderful. We have such a close connection and she's been a dream child, dream adult now her whole life. I, yes. And she was a gift. And I do think there's a reason that I was the one who got to have Colorado's first test tube baby. I really do, because I was the one who would tell the story to other women. Oh, you and I are going to both sit here and cry. I know. But I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really think, oh, maybe there's a reason this took so long, because the time was right for me to have her and be able to share my story of love from the hands of the scientists and the doctors to my arms. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's such a beautiful way to end. Mm-hmm. I I just have these, I'm just picturing just the the nights that I spent rocking him and just <laughs> singing lullabies with tears just streaming down my face. Like, I cannot believe this is my life now. I cannot believe that I have this baby and that I get to be up in the middle of the night. <laughs> that I get to, that I get to wake up every two hours and be with this baby. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I just, I keep, I I keep thanking you over and over again, but it's just, (laughs) it's just so overwhelming. I, yeah. You know, something Elizabeth said to me when she was two and a half, I had just read a book to her and she was just being so dear. And I said, oh, Elizabeth, I am so lucky that God gave you to me. And she looked at me and said, silly mommy, I picked you. Oh, isn't that something? That is and I something. looked at her and I thought, oh, oh, maybe you did. <laughs> maybe yeah. there's so much more to this. And that is the perfect way to end this episode thinking about how these little babies we are entrusted with are the right babies for us and we're the right moms for them, however they got here. Thank you, Ellen, and all the other moms who paved the way for us. 
Thank you so much for listening to the How She Moms podcast and for being part of this community. There are so many other ways for you to connect and hopefully also contribute. I share tips and ideas regularly on Instagram and Facebook at How She Moms. You can find past episodes and other resources at HowSheMoms.com. And you can always just email me directly at Whitney at HowSheMoms.com. Special thanks to my own wonderful mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.